So for this month's Crediton Area Local History Zoom talk, we are very pleased to have with us John Bell, historian and educator uh, of many years standing, who is going to be discussing the history of cinema in Devon, uh, the variety of cinemas which have come and gone throughout the county in our time, uh, and the glory days and perhaps otherwise of some of them, we shall find out as we go through. So I shall pass over to you and I will be back for the Q&A later. Thank you very much and welcome to you, John. Thanks, <clears throat> Thanks very much, Mark. Um, and um, as, uh, as, as you can see, I'm sitting here in the, uh, the Exeter Gaumont in 1939 due to the uh, miracles of Zoom technology. Uh, <clears throat> so before we start properly, I'll... Uh, I will play you some sounds from the uh, the, the Exeter Gaumont, well at least hopefully. <laughs> That's Harold Balam <coughs> sitting in the um, uh, the in the uh, in the 1930s, and um, they were real stars at the time. This is a signed postcard, um, as you can see. <clears throat> now that console, unhappily, does not survive. It was destroyed in the Blitz in 1942, um, but the sound you heard does because the organ pipes were actually removed from the cinema, and they're now in a in the Bertie Fenn Cinema Collection in. Um, in Lincolnshire, and the they are played on a console which is identical to the one in the uh, in the Gaumont. But let's make a start properly. Oops, I'm sorry. For some reason, I can't change the slide. There we go. <clears throat> so what I'm going to talk about is, as it says on the tin here, the uh, the golden age of cinema in Devon from approximately 1920 to 1960. Now, I'm a an extra red coat guide, which means I'm one of those folk who, uh, who take people on guided walks around the city of Exeter. Uh, but I'm also a member of the uh, Devon and Exeter Institution, which some of you probably know. <clears throat> and the origins of this uh, talk actually start there. It's one of those classic discovery stories. Uh, the librarian was doing a bit of clearing out and she found some stuff at the back of a cupboard that she hadn't noticed before. And she dug it out and discovered it was all about stuff to do with cinema in Devon. Um, now, because I and a few other colleagues run a little cinema club at the DEI, she showed it to us. And what it turned out to be was the, uh, the life's work of a chap called Gordon Chapman, uh, who had spent years researching into the, uh, the history of Devon cinemas uh, and other, had obviously... Uh, after his death, his researches had been donated to the uh, to the DEI, and this was all about 20 or 25 years ago. <clears throat> and uh, and sadly, Gordon has long since parted, I'm afraid. But his life's work culminated in this book, Devon at the Cinema, still available. You can buy it on um, on Amazon for about seven pounds. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> at the same time as publishing this work, he also spent um, many years giving talks, rather like this one, in fact. Um, so we decided that it was a shame to stuff all this stuff back in the cupboard. Uh, so we arranged for a little presentation one evening, and we also had a, um, a representative from the uh, the uh, Bill Douglas Museum of Cinema at Exeter University, and uh, and and we put on a presentation which uh, really celebrated uh, Gordon's Gordon's work, and it was a it was a good event. Um, so that's the little origins of this talk. But this all comes with a health warning because I'm not the expert on Devon cinemas. I'm standing on Gordon's shoulders. He was the expert, as that will probably become apparent if you ask me any de detailed questions in the, uh, at the end of the, uh, the, the presentation. But we're going to start off by having a little look at the early cinemas, who built them, how they, how they operated. Then we're going to move into the, uh, the 1930s with the, uh, with the super cinemas. And then later on, in suitably cinematic terms, we'll talk about their, uh, their decline and their fall. So let's have a look at the uh, the map of, uh, of Devon cinemas around 1922. 
Um, now, there weren't a great many of the sort of uber super cinemas around. But as you can see, there's a fair old spread um, of cinemas around the county with clusters um, in Plymouth um, and, in, uh, and in Exeter and in Torbay. Uh, and then smaller numbers elsewhere, but a reasonable covering, including Crediton, as you can see right in the middle there with its single star, and more of that uh, a little bit later on. And these little cinemas were often run by local entrepreneurs, and some of them were, uh, were real characters. For example, <clears throat> Gordon Chapman received a letter uh, from a patron of one such cinema, and he says this, I remember going to my first visit to the cinema at the age of five. That was in 1920 at the Regent in Market Square, Axminster. The film was Charlie Chaplin and Jackie Coogan in The Kid, and the cinema was run by Mr. Walford, who had a wooden leg. There was a ladder to get up to the projection box. How we got up there, I don't know, but he did. Some uh, cinemas in, in Devon are really rather extraordinary. Uh, <clears throat> this is the, the Picture House in Paynton, and it boasts to be the oldest purpose-built cinema in Europe. When it was built around 1909, the word cinema didn't even exist. Uh, and this place was originally called, get this, the Electric Bioscopic Exhibition Centre with entertainment suitable for ladies. Now, doesn't that sound a lot better than The View? Um, it's the place where famously Paris Singer had his own special box uh, together with his lover, the uh, exotic dancer Isadora Duncan. Um, and in later years, Agatha Christie had two permanently reserved seats as well, one for her and one for her butler. Um, it's amazing how the lengths people will go to avoid queuing for a chock ice, isn't it? Of course, this famous and beautiful building has just recently received a grant for its restoration, uh, which is really excellent news. But about a year after it was constructed, Exeter had its first cinema, the Empire Electric. Uh, <clears throat> and here you can see it is in, uh, in High Street. Um, certainly the first purpose built one. It was owned by the Devon and Somerset stores. There are continuous performances from two in the afternoon till 10 o'clock at night. Um, and Gordon Chapman recalled talking to people about this. And this is what he says about the Empire Electric. He said, Sonians who remember this cinema speak of it as a flea pit. And now there seems to be some inverted snobbery here, as many cinemas gain this accolade. And there is a, there is a pride in the voice of the ex-patron when telling of his or her visits to such a cinema, not the only one called a flea pit. Um, it became a casualty of the new uh, super cinemas and it closed its doors finally in 1937. Um, and then it was destroyed utterly in the, uh, in the 1942 bombing raid uh, on, on Exeter. Um, in comparison, this rather splendid place, uh, the Riviera in Tynmouth, uh, was initially built by Lord Courtney and uh, 40 plus other shareholders and opened in 1826 as an assembly room. But then in 1912, Mr. Charlie Poole bought it and, and ran it as a, uh, as, a, as a ballroom and as a cinema. And then in 1934, it was converted at quite a substantial cost of 33,000. And the aim was to keep the big cinema chains like the Odin's and Beaumont's out of Tynmouth. And in that, it was certainly successful. However, on a much smaller scale, here we have the, the, uh, the Cozy in Topsham, run in the 1920s by a major Gould, um, who succeeded in combining the careers of uh, a, a builder, um, fire officer, cinema proprietor, and musician. And this latter skill came in very handy when for some very special films, he would um, join the pianist uh, to play his violin in accompanying the, uh, the, the silent movies. The pianist, incidentally, was one of either two ladies, uh, Mrs. Gladys Green, who was the Topsham station master's wife, and the other was a Mrs. Drew, who it was said, with some awe, came all the way from Exeter. And um, Gould projected his, uh, his silent films from a hand-cranked projector. Um, while Mrs. Drew accompanied uh, on, the, on the piano. But if the DC electric supply for the bulb failed, then the, the assistant uh, projectionist, Gordon Eds, would have to nip down the road um, and ask a fellow called Watt Watt Chesney uh, to slip the drive belt back on the generator down in White Street. Um, and the projection room was so small, you could only actually get one person at a time. 
So um, if the projectionist had a call to take, the film just had to stop and wait until he got back. Now, the builder of the Tivoli Theatre in Tiverton, which was constructed in 1934, uh, was a Mr. Gregory Eastman, uh, who in his 93rd year recalled how he came to build the Tivoli. And this is, uh, this is what he said, and I really love this story. He says this, I was at the Empire, Leicester Square, with the lovely Lorna, with no money in my pocket, but we went to see the film Broadway Melody of 1929. And I thought, well, now, well, now, I was so thrilled with the film, so absolutely thrilled with it. that I dumped my beautiful lauder in London and came home to Tiverton and built the Tivoli and the one in uh, South Moulton, the Savoy. I didn't, I didn't have more than sixpence in my pocket, but my father guaranteed the loan at Lloyd's Bank. So we were able to build. it. And it was a wonderful tale. Now, some uh, people connected with the cinemas became quite important characters in their own right. This is Harry Clare, um, a manager from the, uh, the Odeon cinema chain. Uh, and the, the job of the, uh, the manager uh, was very multifaceted, but in particular, they had to be good at publicity, publicizing what was, uh, what was coming on. Um, and you can see Harry there um, publicizing a, a, a film about Edith Cavell, and he's got all sorts of bits and pieces in the, in the foyer. And we'll come back to some of Harry's antics a little bit later on. But some of these smaller places didn't have people like Harry. Uh, this is the former Scala uh, cinema in, uh, in Ottery St. Mary. You can see the little blue plaque there on the wall to the right of the door. Quite unusual. Most of these little cinemas are entirely forgotten now. But they didn't have a Harry Clare. One patron <coughs> recalls how that operated. Cinema was run by a single family. Dad was the projectionist. Mum sold the tickets. And daughter, if she'd done her own work, tore them up and uh, showed you to your seat. Um, he also went on to say that they had movie tone news, which was only about three weeks out of date. And it had a tin roof at the time, which was just about okay if it rained, but if it hailed, you couldn't hear a thing. He also said that if the film wasn't terribly popular, the first six people were allowed in free. But if nobody else arrived, they're all sent home. Uh, but if other people did come, then mother went round and, uh, and, and collected the money. And apparently <laughs> regular customers had their own seats. Not that they were booked. It was just understood that they were their seats. And even there were a number of, um, of double seats, which sounds terribly modern, for, uh, for courting couples. Uh, and these were located in a, pair, a part of the uh, auditorium known as Orner's Corner, for reasons that are now completely different at the time. Now, the manager of the Burlington, <coughs> uh, later the ABC in Torquay, uh, was Mr Dudley Fleming. As manager, he had to arrange for full spreads in the local paper. He'd provide uh, free tickets for competition winners, uh, like crosswords. He had to acquire a monkey to publicize the Tars a Tarzan film. Uh, he set up an advanced dressing station in the foyer for a First World War film. And he even managed to get hold of some costumes worn by Catherine Hepburn to be uh, raffled at a charity auction. So lots and lots of things for the managers to do at that particular one. Um, but by 1935, the big circuits were beginning to arrive, like the Gaumont, seen here in Barnstable. There were uh, other Gaumonts as well in, uh, in Exeter and Plymouth. The Modian cinemas were beginning to, uh, to arrive as well. And these big super cinemas built, oh, sorry, constructed buildings which were extremely controversial at the time in some cases. For example, <coughs> In his book, The Making of the English Town, David Lloyd says, the most imaginative type of interwar building was the cinema. Behind the fantasy foyers of the Odeons and the Gaumonts were the Art Deco Auditoria, where people made their periodic escapes into Hollywood. And we'll talk a bit more about Hollywood in a, in a while. Uh, but this is the original interior of what was firstly the Royal, later the uh, ABC, then the MGM, then the ABC again, and finally the real cinema in Plymouth, which sadly closed its doors only a couple of years ago. <clears throat> but the building of the Odeon Cinema in, uh, in Exeter uh, brought about quite a number of different views. I wonder if you can guess where this little quotation comes from. <clears throat> the coming of the Odeon is an epoch in the entertainment of the life of Exeter. It is a distinct and unique addition to the amenities of the town. The most advanced principles 
theatre, cinema, construction have been used and have been embodied in the design. And patrons will find that in all the 2,000 seats, no matter where they sit, perfection of reproduction will be enjoyed in absolute comfort. The staff of specially trained usherettes and attendees will be at your disposal. Their primary consideration being courtesy, efficiency, and willing service to patrons. Any thoughts where that came from? If anybody's guessed that's from the opening night program of the Odeon Cinema, you'll be quite right. But not everybody was quite so pleased. This is what Thomas Sharp said. Thomas Sharp, of course, was the, the great post-war planner um, who redesigned the city of Exeter after 1945. And this is what he said about the cinema. A deplorable example of a complete lack of consideration is shown in the way that the new Odeon Cinema has been allowed to dominate the city by piling its great humpback mass on the summit of the Sidwell Street Ridge. A shapeless lump of a building which rides the city like a totalitarian Mammonite cathedral. I don't think he liked it very much, really. However, alongside these great new picture palaces, the little cinemas in the, uh, in the rural areas continue to exist. Um, this is uh, what was the Braunton Plaza. It's still extant, as you can see, has gone packed fruit and vegetables. And it was run by the owners, Mr. and Mrs. Drake, who sat in the foyer. And Mrs. Drake, apparently, was, a, 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 was extremely glamorous and looked like a film star. But meanwhile, uh, Minnie Daniels, the usherette, was walking up and down the aisle, spraying the air and the patrons uh, with a highly perfumed air freshener. Very nice, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm sure. Meanwhile, in Oakhampton, at the Oakhampton premiere, a chap called Sibby, who was a short little man, uh, used to walk up and down the aisle wearing a, uh, a light coloured bowler hat and tapping his walking stick and saying, now then, you boys, be quiet. You boys, be quiet. Be quiet. Um, that place later morphed into Nero's, as you can see there. I, I, I don't think we really missed anything, anything much there. But now it's, um, it's called the uh, Toast. It's quite a nice cafe opposite Oakhampton Surviving Cinema, uh, the Carlton. Now, we mentioned Harry Clare before, and prior to him assuming his role as Odeon manager in Exeter, he ran the Odeon in Newton Abbott, as you can see here. And he was particularly active in developing publicity stunts. So here we've got him with a Morris pen with a loudspeaker on the front. And although it's very difficult to see because the quality of the picture is poor, on the top there's a, a wooden jungle cutout advertising Dorothy Lamore in a film called Hurricane. Uh, and this is what he did to the Newton Abbott Odeon. To, uh, to celebrate the uh, coronation of George VI. Um, rather uh, rather uh, a, fine, uh, a fine effort, I think you'll, uh, you'll, you'll all agree. Meanwhile, in Penton, the Palladium had opened in 1932 with a, a film called The Midship Maid. And if you, uh, if you look carefully down the cast list, you'll find Midshipman Golightly, uh, played by one John Mills in his first ever, ever cinema role. 1,100 capacity in this cinema, and they were all entertained on the first night by uh, Melbourne Holman on the Wonder Christie organ. 1,100 people, and it wasn't that wasn't considered big by any manner of means. Um, the uh, the program notes for the Palladium assured the audience that the cinema was practically British made throughout, and despite being fireproof, it could be evacuated within two minutes, which is a bit optimistic. Anyway. Um, Lesser crises could be dealt with uh, more privately, as the note in the programme says. Patrons anticipating an urgent telephone message or call can obtain from the pay box a special form, which will ensure immediate attention. Should such a message or call come through, or is it your service, Clement R. Tree, Director and General Manager? In 1939, it was renamed the Odeon, having become part of that chain. Um, and it closed the cinema in the 1950s when it became a bingo club and it was, uh, it was demolished in 1988. Now, talking of safety, this is the, uh, the 1887 fire which destroyed um, the Theatre Royal in, in Exeter. And it wasn't the first fire to destroy a theatre in Exeter, it was actually the third. So, uh, so not surprisingly, um, citizens of Exeter were uh, particularly concerned about safety. This was a real tragedy, 186 people died in this. It still remains the worst um, theatre tragedy in, uh, in, in English theatrical history. 
And it was made all the worse by this chap. Some of you, I'm sure, have come across uh, William McGonagall, the Scottish self style poet and tragedian, who thought he was a genius, whereas the rest of the world was well aware that he was probably the world's worst poet ever. Now, you, you, you've probably come across him in connection with the, the, his poems about the Tay Bridge, you know, um, Oh, beautiful bridge or the silvery tea, alas, alas, etc. Well, he, the, the disaster at Exeter Theatre came to his attention um, and he decided to, to pen what, what he would have undoubtedly called one of his poetic gems to commemorate the event. And um, I, think you, uh, I think you deserve to be reminded of the qualities of the poet. <clears throat> The play on this night was called the Romany Rai. At act four, scene third, fired, fired was the cry. And all in a moment, flames were seen issuing from the stage. Then the women screamed frantically, like wild beasts in a cage. And the panic ensued and everyone felt dismayed. And from the burning building, a rush was made. And soon the theatre was filled with a blinding smoke. So people, their way out, had to grope. Well, whatever um, new... Uh, laws were brought in, anything was better than that, frankly. Nonetheless, the building which had hosted Exeter's first ever showing of moving pictures back in 1896, the, um, the Victoria Hall, burnt down in 1919. One of the problems was the nitrate film stock that was in use at the time was highly, highly flammable, and uh, fires in cinemas became a constant menace. Um, consequently, the 1910 Cinematographic Act was aimed solely at uh, preventing this and, and, and making sure that, uh, that patrons had some safety. But some local authorities, in fact many of them, took the opportunity to use this act, not just to look after the physical welfare of their patrons, um, but also their, um, uh, their moral welfare. They set up, in fact, local censorship panels. And it was the misuse of this act that as late as the 1930s prevented the showing of Frankenstein at the Exeter Gaumont. But he didn't stop him showing it at Topsham. So busloads of horror fans made the trip from Exeter down to Topsham to see, uh, to see Frankenstein. And what did the government show instead? It showed this, Murders in the Rue Morgue, uh, about uh, the murder of a prostitute, starring, would you believe, Bella Lugosi, who was also the star of Frankenstein. So obviously that was all right then. Um, and as I said, fire in cinemas was a constant threat. It destroyed the Totnes Cinema in 1944. And according to the, um, the local newspaper report at the time, the only thing that uh, the manager, uh, Mr. Tapley, was able to save from the ruin was his parrot. Presumably, he was showing Treasure Island at the time. This is uh, Wallace Beery and Jackie Coogan in the pre-war version. But I have to say, I've no idea who played the part of the parrot. Now, in Bobby Tracy, fire wasn't quite such a problem, or oughtn't to have been, because the cinema was actually on top of the fire station, which, according to local patrons of the time, was fine during the silent era. But come the talkies, they couldn't hear a thing uh, when the fire engine was called out, and they reported bitterly they never got any money back when that happened. However, um, the cinema was emptied on purpose on one occasion due to fire. It wasn't a fire in the cinema. It was the uh, fish and chip shop that was burning down across the road. So they all rushed, rushed out to see it. Now, sadly, McGonagall was not present to record that event. Had he been so, I'm sure he would have done his usual job on it. We can imagine his thoughts, can't we? And all agreed, the fire brigade had been extremely nippy to prevent the burning of the Bobby Tracy chapel. The 1920s saw the irresistible rise of Hollywood. And it's, it's interesting to think that um, in 1914, 25% of all films shown in British cinemas were British made. Um, but by the 1920s, that had dropped to 5%. Um, and the, uh, the, the slump in 1924 had led to quite a number of um, film studios closing down. So another cinematographic act was passed in that year to uh, ensure that a quota of British made films were shown in British cinemas and to an extent it worked. Um, lots more films made in Britain began to be shown. Problem was they weren't very good. They were made in a rush. Uh, they were designed um, to answer this uh, problem and they became known as the quota quickies uh, and pretty ropey many of them uh, many of them were and some historians have, have actually blamed that um, idea for um, inhibiting the growth of the uh, British film industry. Um, however, some of them did actually employ people who went on to make a very considerable name for themselves in the world of cinema. 
Here we've got one directed by Michael Powell, who went on to be one of the great auteurs of, uh, of British cinema and is still highlighted today um, as, uh, as, as, a, as a brilliant uh, director. And in the 30s, the British film industry began to pick up. Um, and some of the films that it produced were, um, were remarkably successful, both here and abroad. Many of them uh, as a result of the work of Alexander Corner. This is one of the classic ones of the time of the 1930s, The Private Life of Henry VIII. And what I really love about this poster is the stuff at the top right. What a king, what a man, what a lover. When I sometimes have the dubious pleasure of showing French teenagers around um, um, Exeter and having to explain to them the Reformation, this is a line I use with them repeatedly. Kelwa, Kelom, Kelamaras, and uh, gets me through the next five minutes at any rate. Amongst the other features of the uh, film industry were um, stars from the musical, uh, people like Gracie Fields, George Forby, Jesse Matthews, and here uh, we can see Will Hay uh, <clears throat> in one of the films that, uh, that I think has endured, it's endured for me anyway, Oh Mr. Porter, uh, in which occurs the memorable line, next train's gone. Talking of trains, <clears throat> um, this is a, 19, uh, sorry, a 2014 stamp commemorating a film called Nightmare, which uh, some of you I'm sure will recall. And it marks the beginning of the documentary movement in, in this country. Uh, do you remember Nightmare? This is the Nightmare crossing the border, bringing the check and the post order, letters for the rich, letters for the poor, the shop at the corner, the girl next door. Um, music by Benjamin Britten, um, words by W.H. Auden, and made by the post office or at least the post office film unit, which was very central in that, to the production of documentaries uh, like this. Um, but nonetheless, uh, as the 30s went on, the big cinemas were still being built. This is the state at St. Budo, probably the last big cinema, well, last cinema to be constructed in Plymouth uh, before the war. Opening night featured Diana Durbin in That Certain Age. She was at the height of her fame. Previous year, she'd got an Oscar, Special Academy Award, no less, for, quotes, bringing to the screen the spirit and personification of youth. I don't think they give them for that uh, anymore. Um, later on, the building survived the Blitz, unlike many in Plymouth. And by the late 1960s, it had become part of the rank circuit and was known as the Mayflower. By the mid 70s, it had become a bingo hall. Then it went on to become a snooker center and as you can see, a, a carpet shop. And I think now it's just entirely closed. So I, I may not be quite up to date on, uh, on that one. But anyone who could remember going to the cinema in the 1930s, look back on a really golden age. Never again would they be quite so luxurious. Never again would patrons be made to feel quite so important that the staff of the Gaumont and the Odeon ministering to their every need. And you've got to remember most of the people who went to the cinema in the 30s and the 40s uh, were working class people and, and huge numbers of, of women. And sometimes they went up to five nights a week. Now, these were people who normally served other people. So the experience of somebody serving them was a very refreshing joke. So it's not uh, surprising that the uh, going to the pictures was quite so popular. But then along came the war. And the manager of the Odeon in Exeter uh, in the late 30s and the war years was our old friend Harry Clare, having moved from Newton Abbott. And you can see he's still up to his old car advertising tricks. Here he's got a Hillman um, with the black headlights of the Blitz, and he's draped it with a Union in Jack. Um, and he's uh, somehow got a stuffed lion's head uh, to stick on the bonnet to uh, promote the film, the Alexander Corder film, of course, The Lion Has Wings. Um, to help patrons leave the cinema in the blackout, Harry got the commissioner's hat painted in a luminous paint so they could all follow him out. Uh, and it was tricks like this, um, which meant that Harry was well regarded in the Odeon world. And he received the following letter from the great Oscar Deutsch, um, who ran the Odeon chain um, in, I think, 19, early 1941. And, um, and this is what uh, Oliver Deutsch said to Harry. Dear Claire, he said, it is with great pleasure that I send you the kinematograph weekly plaque for your fine efforts in keeping the flag of Odeon flying with some memorable publicity during the last year. I first of all want to congratulate you on your energy and your showmanship. And as a token of my personal appreciation, I would like to accept checking closed. 
I deplore the fact that this year I am unable to present you in person owing to the uh, unhappy conditions in existing. But you may rest assured it is because of these very conditions under which you have carried out the good work I am doubly appreciative. Oscar Deutsch. Sadly, letters like that seem to be a thing of the past. Oscar Deutsch died in December 1941 at the early age of 48. And of course, Odeon reputedly stands for Oscar Deutsch entertains our nation. It's a nice thought, isn't it? Now, <clears throat> this is that well-known surfing dude, George Bernard Shaw. I'm afraid. Well, when the surf wasn't up, he did a bit of writing, as you're probably aware, including a letter to the Times on the uh, 5th of September 1939, in which he asked, what agent of Chancellor Hitler is it who has suggested we should all cower in darkness and terror for the duration? Uh, his letter was referring to the fact that with the outbreak of war, the government had closed theatres and cinemas, uh, all places of entertainment, in fact. Um, uh, Shaw thought this was a masterstroke of unimaginative stupidity. Uh, and the government obviously took, uh, took his word because within uh, a matter of weeks, they'd opened them all again. Um, in fact, during the war, 10 cinemas um, in Devonport, Plymouth and Exeter were destroyed um, in bombings and quite a number of others were damaged. This is the poor old Palladium um, in Paris Street uh, in, in, in Exeter. Now, during the war, um, filmmakers turned back to those documentaries, techniques and skills that we were talking about earlier on um, and used them within films to promote the war effort. Um, this is a, a classic one called Went, Went the Day Well from 1942, which is also the model for a much later film called The, uh, the Eagle Has Landed with Michael Caine. Uh, but there were many other um, popular films. And indeed, you can still normally pick these films up, you know, daytime on Channel 4 or, 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 or whatever. Um, films like Went, uh, Went the Day Well here, Millions Like Us, uh, This Happy Breed, um, Mrs. Miniver. And then, of course, Michael, uh, sorry, um, uh, <coughs> sorry, Michael Powell cooperated with Emmerich Pressburger to, uh, to produce some of the best of them, uh, like The Life and Death of Colonel Blimp, and my own favourite, A Canterbury Tale. But probably one of the best known is this one, <coughs> in which we serve. And this is a curious mix of, um, to, to tell the story of an almost real ship, it uses both documentary techniques mixed in with the showbiz expertise of its director, uh, Noel Coward. Now, prior to making this, apparently Coward's only experience of the Royal Navy had led him to the conclusion that they, uh, they have the best manners in the world. Well, what else do you need to, to win a war? Now, I don't know if you're aware of this. Um, I came across it in something that Gordon had written. Um, it's, it's the relationship of credit to Gro Gaumont British distributors. In June 1988, Gordon received a letter from a local credit and resident, and this is Blackmore, which is B. Blackmore, um, about credit and links with the, um, the Gaumont British cinema chain during the war. I don't know if you know about this, and if you do, I'm sorry for being repetitive, but it appears that Gaumont British moved their entire financial operation to credit. Um, they bought a, 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 a large house, uh, and all the takings of Gaumont cinemas throughout the country were brought by train to credit to be accounted for. Um, and they also moved all, a lot of their staff to, uh, to, to credit. Um, so in the grounds of this house, they built a dance hall, needed to say a cinema, uh, and also chalets for the, um, for the, for the staff to live in. And uh, Mrs. Blackmore, who worked for Gaumont British, uh, went on to say that all trace of this enterprise had entirely disappeared. So you may know a lot more about that than, uh, than I. After the war, um, <clears throat> a lot of the cinemas chose to run Saturday clubs for children. And um, the Extra Gaumont, for example, was run by Auntie Rose from Barley Mount, who came from a showbiz family. And the usual um, cartoons, cliffhanger series, and all that sort of thing um, were shown. And uh, Mrs. Neal led the children in the song, but not to be outdone. Uh, Gaumont also opened, and I do hope you can hear the sound on this one, uh, because they also produced a, um, a, a song uh, recalled by an old friend of mine. Every Saturday morning, where do we go? Getting into mischief, oh dear, no. Join the Mickey Mouse Club, this will be our song. Every Saturday morning at the Odeon. 
Well, I hope you got that. But there's the lines. And if I'd been with you in credit and you'd be singing this now. So you've made a lucky escape every Saturday morning. Where do we go? Getting into mischief. Oh, dear. No. Join the Mickey Mouse Club. This will be our song every Saturday morning at the OD on. And um, there's Harry Clare standing in the middle of um, appears to be hundreds and hundreds of kids. In the 1950s and early 60s, the cinema turned to spectacle as an attempt to um, compete with the newly arriving TV. And uh, this, of course, as you can see, is uh, from Ben-Hur. Uh, in a way, it was a return to the old days of Birth of a Nation and uh, Cecil B. Mill and all that kind of, kind of stuff. But um, I don't believe anybody can still be unmoved by the chariot race sequence in Ben-Hur. Of course, the film's recently been remade yet again. Uh, but nonetheless, the writing was on the wall for cinemas. And um, I'm very pleased with this slide because you can see writing on the wall. Um, comes from a, uh, a film called Slaves of Babylon in 1953, just in case you're wondering. I'm sure we, we all remember that one. But the figures make sad reading. There you go, 1946, when 1,600 million tickets uh, were sold. That was, the, sorry, 1948, the, the absolute peak of cinema attendance in this country just a couple of years after the war. And as you can see, by, uh, by 1984, that had sunk to an all-time low of 54 million. Now, it, it, it's creeping up a little bit more now. Um, I think we're around 75, 80 million um, before the pandemic. But nonetheless, um, cinemas were closing all over the country. First of all, the small ones, then the large ones. Here's the, um, <coughs> the end of the ABC in Exeter, for example. But they survived, or at least the building survived for quite a long time. This is the Savoy in South Moulton. Now, you may remember that the Savoy was uh, the one built by Mr. Gregory Eastman, having dumped the lovely Laura in London, along with the Tivoli. Gordon visited it um, in 1997, and he said, I was amazed at the state of preservation, both within and without. The exterior of the Savoy is as built. And although the interior is now used as an auction room, it too has preserved much of its former charm. This was a typical small town cinema, reflecting, however indirectly, the then current style of cinema architecture, somewhere between Art Deco and the functional style imported from the continent. Adding to the interest, says Gordon, um, and excitement, is the fact that in this cinema, the projection room is still there with all its equipment. Well, that was 1997. This is what it's like now. It's a housing estate. This is the Honiton uh, cinema. <clears throat> and again, when he visited it, Gordon found a lot of things in it to, uh, to be of interest. It had opened in 1914 and it closed um, in the 1930s. Uh, but he found decorative plaster work uh, within the building. And he says similar plaster work can be seen in many early cinemas, a legacy of the music hall theatre style uh, of a previous generation. Best example I ever came across of this was in Ilfracombe. This is the former Palace Cinema uh, in Ilfracombe. Um, it became Woolworths, now it's Super Drug. But in 2003, it was explored by two intrepid locals who poked their camera through the false ceiling and came up with some quite remarkable images. It's a bit like exploring the Titanic, isn't it? Only drier. Well, marginally drier, given it's Elfricum. But look, decorative little cherubs drawn by um, a chap called Gustav Roberts from Munich. They're still there. The cinema closed in 1926. It's quite extraordinary. Now, as you're all no doubt aware, I think the only cinema to operate in, in Crediton uh, was, the, uh, was the Palace. I mean, films that had previously been shown in the, uh, in the town hall. Um, but the cinema was built around 1930, and up until 1939, it remained the property of the uh, Credit and Cinema Company Limited. After the war, um, it became part of a small circuit of cinemas run by a chap called Charles Scott, and it was still owned by him as late as uh, 1969, though by then it had been known as the, as the Regal. Uh, this is a plan of it. Uh, and as you may be able to see, one of its great claim to fame is it had 365 seats. So you could go there every day and get a different view. Uh, later on, it was, a, it was equipped with, uh, with cinema scope. Well, this is what it looks like today, of course. Um, though when Gordon Chapman visited it 25 years ago, it too 
still had working switch, switch gear in place from its time as a cinema. Gordon thought it was just about 1975. He would probably know, know better than that. Um, well, at least the building is, uh, is still there. But the days when every town had its own small purpose-built cinema, sadly, have, um, have long gone. So not all. Back to Ilfra Coombe again. This is the Embassy um, Cinema. Now, um, it's now part of a small chain called Merlin Cinemas. Um, but possibly Mark, like me, will remember it some years ago in the 1970s, 80s, when it was run by a family, Mr. and Mrs. Tuffin. And, um, and it wasn't called the Embassy then. They called it the, the Pendle Stairway to the Stars. Was there ever, ever a better name for a cinema? Let it stand for all those that we've lost. And I hope you can hear the song. If you take a walk down a Devon street on a quiet afternoon, buy a coffee shop and the chemist store, an old building starts to loom. It's a carpet place, or a sale room now, or it's full of antique stalls. But years ago it was loved by all, as the local cinema hall. Step inside the door, cross a dusty floor, there's a window filled with signs. Where the kids would pay a tanner a seat And their parents one and nine Into the hall it is gloomy here But look on the walls you'll see A touch of gold and some crimson paint The glory that used to be Oh, where is the Roxy? The Aster, the Star, the Gaumont, and the Esaldo, and those nights filled with fag smoke, with laughter and tears, the hisses, boos, and hurrahs. They're lost now in time, for the doors have all closed on our stairway to the stars. On our stairway to the stars. Look back on the wall, there the spiders crawl, where the great screen used to be. Where the stars came out every night for all who had gathered there to see. There was Fred and Ginger. Errol Flynn and others time forgot. If wolves could speak, what tales they tell of the cinema's golden days. I'm putting on my top hat, tying up my white tie, though the memories fade. Turn around and look where the back row was Full of lovers and some fleas A secret kiss from your favourite girl If the manager didn't see Then it's out as soon as the credits rolled If you stayed and lingered long You'd have to stand and sing for the king and pretend that you knew the song. Oh, where is the Roxy, the Aster, the Star, the Gaumont and the Esaldo, and those nights filled with fag smoke, with laughter and tears, the hisses, boos and hurrahs. They're lost now in time, for the doors have all closed on our stairway to the stars, on our stairway to the stars. 
Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, John. I'm just going to uh, change the security permissions. There we go. So if people want to turn their camera on uh, and join us in the room, they should now be able to do so. Um, I do indeed remember when the embassy was the Pendle stairway to the stars. Um, in fact, I think, was it not the embassy again prior to being called the Pendle? Yes, it was. It was yeah. the, the embassy is the original name of the yeah. cinema, which is why it's called it again. Yes, and Merlin yeah. took it back on. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. my my overriding memory of of the embassy first time round, and then subsequently Pendle, was was the fact that there was um, a, a very there was probably more dust than there was material on the seats in some places, um, and obviously being in the days before the restrictions on smoking inside public buildings, it was very difficult at times to actually see the screen <laughs> for the number of people sort of uh, sat in front of you uh, who had a cigarette. Going. Um, it wasn't just uh, wasn't only dust on the seats. If it was snowing heavily, you got snow on them as well because the roof wasn't great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it all added to the charm of, of, of rural cinemas, I think, didn't it? Um, there, there's a, a comment from, uh, I'll turn the screenshot off, okay. uh, a comment from Tony Gale in the chat early on, who, who noted that there were double seats in the back row of the Electric Theatre in Tiverton in the 1960s, although Tony neglects to say um, what he did in those double <laughs> seats. But, um, there we go, yeah, so double seats there too. If you want to ask a question to uh, John, do um, uh, indicate in some way, either in the chat or by using the little raise hand thing, or just by waving frantically at the screen as, as you see fit. Um, <laughs> oh, Tony can't tell us what he did in those seats because his wife's sitting next to him. Bless. Sorry about that, Tony. Um, what's the future of cinema in Devon, John, do you think? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's pretty healthy. <clears throat> um, the, uh, the That little Merlin cinema, uh, chain, which I mentioned, owns the embassy, owns a number around the... Um, yeah, they've got uh, the Oakhampton one, haven't they? Opposite they have got the Carlton in, yeah. in, in Oakhampton and one yeah. or two more as, as, as well. Um, and um, I actually do a companion uh, talk to this, which just looks at the, the cinemas in, <clears throat> in Exeter. And at one time, the Odeon uh, was the only one that was left. Um, but then, of course, the picture house opened and now the view has been open for over 10 years. Um, so you know, it, it, it all seemed to be going pretty well. And as I said, the, um, the numbers attending cinemas were increasing again, very encouragingly. But beyond that, and I haven't mentioned this, is the number of, um, of little film clubs that, that, that operate um, in organisations of all kinds of uh, you know, a, a different, uh, different places and, and in villages as well. So I think the, you know, the future of film is, uh, is, is, is promising. Um, it seems to be now something that people actively want to go and enjoy as part of a group. Yes, and of course <laughs> there, are, there are things like um, the uh, Picture House in Exeter and various others that do accessible screenings on a morning, uh, yeah. screenings for, you know, primarily for young children or for autistic audiences and so mm. on, where, where you can just wander around and do what you need to do during Absolutely. the film, which are wonderful. Um, yeah. and, and what about the live broadcast of theatre? Oh, fantastic. Yes, absolutely brilliant. Um, the first time I went to one of those, I was bowled over by it. Um, and um, it was it, it was fantastic because you get the best the best of all worlds. Yeah. And um, you get the, um, you know, the, the feeling of being in the um, in the theatre, but you also get the advantages of close up. Yes. Um, so I think it's uh, it's a fantastic way of, uh, of, of presenting stuff. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I saw Warhorse um, that way uh, yeah. uh, and it was absolutely brilliant. Uh, mm. Isabel in the chat says you mentioned the inflammable type of film as a danger. That's nitrate film stock, mm. which uh, yeah did, did do away with a number of cinemas in its time. Um, but if everyone was smoking, did that also cause fires? Yeah. 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 I, I, uh, yeah. A, a cinema full of people smoking and nitrate film stock was not a good, you know, was not a good combination. And uh, and yes, I'm I'm sure that absolutely uh, contributed much. And as Mark has said, the amount of dust in some of these cinemas and general crud, uh, which will be around, wouldn't uh, wouldn't have helped matters either. Very very poor safety regulations. Yeah, I wonder what what percentage of of cinemas now are still run independently or semi independently compared to. 
um, the uh, well, larger chains like the Odin and the View. I mean, the Tiv Tivoli in, in Tiverton is still going pretty strong, I think. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. I mean, it's a real contrast between the huge chains that run things like the View um, and then you know, the smaller chains like the Merlins that we've got down here in the southwest that I mentioned previously. But then individual places, um, you know, work to preserve their own cinema like they're doing in Paynton um, and in other parts of the uh, of the country, like um, the Roxy in Berkhamsted, in Berkhamsted, for example, is a classic example where they've really worked hard to recall that lovely cinema back to life and run it as a real event. When you go there, you feel a bit like you're in the 1930s. It's a really a really special event uh, and that's local initiatives it's great yeah i i, I did hear a uh, possibly apocryphal or possibly not apocryphal story about the tivoli in, in tiverton um i can't he might even been sue in the library that told me this about about a couple turning up and saying um you know what what time is the screening tonight and the cinema owner pottering around there saying what time can you get here yes uh, <laughs> and, and i think possibly some do still operate that way you know yes the, yeah. I think so. Mind you, I've been to the um, to the picture house in Exeter where it spelled a bit like that. Mm. You know, there's me and three other people in there, and it started on time, but it could have started earlier. Yeah, I've been to a screening in the View with with you know six people in a in a screen, mm. but I think yeah. I think they they're obliged with the license to show it, aren't they? Yeah. Regardless, yeah, yes, um, they, they, they I, are. Yeah. On, on, on other occasions, um, I've been to the um, <coughs> to the picture house. Um, I went to see a very strange film there called um, Morris: The Life of Bells which was all about a Morris dancer. Um, and um, I went in the afternoon and as I was coming out, I heard this very strange noise in the auditorium. And I couldn't understand what it was. When I got out there, I realized there was a queue out of the auditorium down the street of at least a hundred Morris men, all in Morris gear with their <laughs> bells. But it was the bells jangling that I could hear. So on occasions like that, when you've got a really specific film, uh, which is targeting a particular audience, great fun. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, absolutely, and it's always good to try and try and catch a film late in its run if you want to have a, a decent experience because then everybody else has seen it, so you, yeah, you get a, yeah. a, a, you know, a, a. Can I can I ask Mark? Um, yeah. I, I guess you'll all have known about the um, the, the cinema in in Crediton, but um, was that story about um, the uh, the wartime? Um, use of you know, all the go money the coming to credit and was that is that news to anybody or is it common knowledge in credit? nobody's mentioned it in the chat if you do know anything about that do do please indicate i i don't know about it but um it certainly sounds very plausible while while people are possibly doing that there is a, a question or comment from the mm -hmm. audience in the museum um yeah so i will pass over to david at our hello, hello. Can you? Ah, you can hear me, right? Yes, okay. yes we can. It's a bit different. There are five, six of us gathered around here at the museum, Excellent. having watched the talk, and it was really very entertaining, John. Thanks very much for it. I wasn't <laughs> quite sure what to expect, to be perfectly honest, <laughs> but it was a really, a really extensive whiz round Devon cinemas for um, sort of 70, 80 years, wasn't it? And it was most interesting. Um, you showed one photograph of Victoria Victoria Hall. Excellent. Yeah. And I don't know whether you said, but I didn't pick it up if you did. Was that in Queen Street or what? Yeah, it's on the it's on the corner of Queen Street and Northern Hay Street. Next to the Rougemont Hotel, then. Opposite the Rougemont Hotel, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. Right. yeah. Same side as same side of, of Queen Street as the uh, Rougemont, but it's the other really side of Northern Hay. Yeah, that's right. Okay, I, I thought perhaps that's where it was, but yeah. it's a bit confusing because I had a, a an advert for Guest's Piano Shop in the yeah. High Street and on Bridge Street or something, didn't it? But that yes, it did. Opposite. It yeah, yeah. But that wasn't um, very close. But I don't. That, sorry. No, go ahead. That, well, I was just thinking that. Um, I, I mean, I can remember seeing the remains, the uh, after the war of the entrance halls to a couple of cinemas that were in Exeter pre-war, yeah. yeah. one in Paris Street, the name of which I can't remember. Hippodrome. Um, Sorry, Palladium. Hippodrome. Palladium. Was it right? Okay. Mm. And then one, which I think was the King's in um, uh, Alf, not Alfington, um, Oakhampton Street. Yeah, that's that was um, that's still there. The that's building. now the that's now the Christian Centre. That's right. Yeah, yeah. After, after the war, though, it became a nightclub. Um, and um, uh, my favourite name for that was um, at some point it was known as the uh, 
the Bally High and Zhivago Club, which I thought covered every geographic possibility, really. <laughs> really, yeah. But I think I'm right in saying that pre-war, there were something like a dozen cinemas in Exeter. Yeah, there were quite there were quite a lot. There were a couple in um, uh, there were a couple in Four Street. Uh, there's there's one building that's still there. Do you know if you know St Olaf's Church in Four Street? Yes, um, yes. If you stand with your back to it and look across the road, um, you'll see something called the Exonian, which is now a bar. Um, and it used to be the Franklin Cinema. Um, it was there in 1912, and it had shut by 1931. Um, but in the 20s, they employed a bloke there called Artful Thomas, who was a real extra character. Um, and he used to walk up and down the aisle, spraying the audience with disinfectant. And um, so gives you the feel for the sort of place it was. But it seems quite modern, doesn't it, in COVID times? Um, and when they were showing um, the Charlie Chaplin film, The Gold Rush, um, Artful Thomas walked around the city dressed as a chicken, plucking. Um, and, and occasionally laying, laying a golden egg. But he was really fortunate to be around because you know that picture I showed you of the fire at the Theatre Royal? He was in the audience that night, so he was actually quite lucky to be around spraying or plucking. Wow, okay. Well, thank you very much indeed, John. Excellent, thank you. Um, Pam in the chat uh, says, yes, she has heard the story about the cinema in Crediton in the war, so that's the, the Gaumont moving operations to Crediton. Good. So, Good. yes, yeah. obviously more... more um, more to look into there, but obviously there is um, there is meat to that story somewhere. Mm. Uh, Tony Gale has his hand up. I can still see his wife sitting next to him, so I guess we're not going to find out what he did in the double seats in the Absolutely. electric. But but carry on, Tony. Absolutely not, Mark. No, but, but another another story about the uh, the early nineteen sixties when I was still very young, of course. Um, and and it refers to your thing about newsreels, John. Oh yeah. One of the special things about newsreels by, by the early 60s was that they were, of course, in colour, whereas we all had black and white TV. And I can recall going to see Summer Holiday with, um, with Cliff Richard <laughs> and, be, and being amazed at the, the number of people who turned up there. This was when the Tivoli was still very, very popular. Yeah. Uh, there was a long queue. And my grandmother, very wisely, said, and I thought, I don't know, there's a lot of lovely background noise here. Um, my grandmother saying very wisely, ah, yes, yes, they'll have all gone to see the royal wedding. And I believe, I believe it was, so, it was, I don't know who, I think it was Princess Marina got married about that time. Who she was, I'm not clear. <laughs> my granny was concerned that must be the draw because you could see that in colour. Ah, right, right. Now, summer holiday, I'm, as I said to you, I'm a member of the film club myself at the DEI in, in Exeter. Uh, and, I, and I keep trying to persuade them to show summer holiday um, and that they, they keep abusing me um, and telling me that, uh, that, that, that I'm a vile person. And why do I want to put them all through that? Um, but I think we ought to show it again. It never gets shown. It's great fun. Show, show it along with that newsreel, would you? Right. Show it along with that newsreel of the royal wedding. Of oh, the royal wedding. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> Thank you. Cheers. Thanks, Tony. Uh, anybody else got anything they'd like to add before we uh, wrap things up? Can I um, can I just add one thing? Um, I want to just share my screen again with you, if that's, if that's okay. Yeah. Yes, please do. It's right. How irritating that is. We can see it. That's, yeah. your, that's your sources, yeah. Yeah, but I want to move on to the to the next slide, and it's, um, it's um, not letting me. Um, it's not letting me do it for some some reason. I should have. Um, oh, there we go. There we go. Um, we got it. Um, this is um, this is an event that um, I just like to draw to your attention. It's a, a special event that Extra Redcoat Guides are doing in cooperation with the Canal and Key Trust, um, and it's next week and the week following, and um, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday nights, and it's a evocation of Exeter's maritime history, um, and um, it's not a lecture. It will be storytelling and it will be songs and it will be pictures and it will be music and it will be great fun. Um, and you can book through the Corn Exchange book, um, uh, booking office. Um, so if you'd, uh, if you'd like to do that and come along, you'd be, uh, you'd be very welcome. So that's my, my, my single plug. Uh, and I will leave it at that, but uh, be nice. No, to no, 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 that's, that's absolutely fine. Thank you very much. Uh, do do leave that on screen for a moment. Um, okay. we, we should probably also mention the Bill Douglas Centre while we're talking about cinema and, yeah. and so on as well. Um, can you tell us anything about that? 
Yeah, Bill Douglas was a, a, a filmmaker um, and um, he lived in, uh, in, in Devon. Um, and he, he was not exactly prolific in, in, in his films, um, but he's best known for a film called Comrades, which was a film about the Toll Puddle Martyrs. Um, but in addition to being a filmmaker, he was also a collector of film memorabilia. And over the years, he amassed an amazing collection of stuff to do with film. And that wasn't just posters and postcards and magazines. It was cinema equipment as well from the very early days from Edwardian, you know, peak to see the, uh, the peak show uh, stuff. Um, and, and when he died, um, he left it all to Exeter Museum on the basis that it would be open free to the public. And it is. So if you just drive up to Exeter Museum and follow the signs of the Bill Douglas Museum, you can just go in free. Um, and you can spend a very happy hour or two uh, looking around this uh, astonishing collection of, uh, of memorabilia. Uh, if you've not been, and as a history society, you may be planning a, you know, a trip at some time in the near future. It's very well worth going. Lovely. Thank you, John. Yes, I, I, would, uh, I would back that up. It is a, a fascinating place to visit. Uh, I think we are there in terms of questions by the looks of it. So... Um, we will wrap up in just a moment. I will tell you one or two things about things that are coming up after this talk. But before I do that, and as I stop recording, um, please do everybody show your appreciation in whichever way you choose to do so in Zoom uh, to John for what was a really, really fascinating presentation on cinemas in Devon. Thank you very much. Thanks, John.